on its own, and it needed all its colonies to come and help it. There was this SOS message. All colonies were asked for help, and the king himself wrote to all the princes and everybody else. That's a nice thing. The conqueror needs our help, and that's what he done. And with that, fellow Toastmasters, other chair in my just place, I got drawn into the vortex of the black hole of World War I. I saw this poster in my fridge. 50 rupees, it said, a princely sum those days for a farmer like me. You know our farmers today don't make much. It was 50 rupees, ladies and gentlemen, in 1914. And there I was. I said, this is something that... There I was. And there I was, I decided that this money is a lot, and I jumped into the world war. I signed up to be a sepoy, and straight I went in, in a ship to Egypt, and that's where I went. I joined the pudding seats, and guess what we were called? King George's own seats, the pudding seats, and Sada Singh was very happy. He went from this war to earn honor for his family, for his village, and to help his nation be proud that it was contributing to the craft. And then we were training in Egypt, along with the Australians, the New Zealanders, and a bunch of people from all over the world. What an exciting time it was. We got to meet all these soldiers, new cultures, new methods, things that we've never known. And it was a lot of fun. And then we were told one day, in two months of our training, that we are going to be shipped to this part of the world in the Mediterranean called Gallipoli. Gallipoli, they said. We didn't quite make sense of what it was. That was the first time I was hearing. How many of you in the room have heard it before? Show your hands. Just two people. Obviously, we don't know anything about Gallipoli. To me, Gallipoli meant Galli and Turin Poli. That's what it was. And I didn't know what to do. And here it was. They explained and briefed us that Gallipoli was a part of Turkey and that the design of the Allied forces was to capture the peninsula of Gallipoli which is this one down here. And we were to attack it from three different fronts. Cape Hill is down there, which the British and the Fording Sikhs were to get into. And then, of course, the Anzac Army, which many of my other brother soldiers from India were there. And of course, Saribag, which the Burkas uh, were supposed to attack. And this was the game plan. And off we went in a ship to this part of the world. And we didn't know what to expect. We landed there. It was cold. And guess what? The Indian soldiers were in their tropical clothes, and we were shivering in the chillness in these trenches. The British had just taken over the, the, the ocean, the seas, and the shores, and then we were to get into these long trenches that were like 20, 30 miles long, and they were called J-11 and the J-13 trenches. And here we were, the coding six, along with a lot of these British soldiers, trying to hold this against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was obviously uh, smaller than us, but they were well positioned and they were fighting to save that nation. They were gritty and they didn't let us move an inch. So these were the trenches in which we fought. And let me explain how the trenches were. Every night we would be there. Day and night, the shells would just come from each side, pouring as though like a Punjab rain, and we would be starting to cover in these trenches. People would suddenly die on the left and the right and blood would flow. And we couldn't stop. We had only one choice, keep firing and hope that we would stay alive. Days passed and we could not get out of these trenches because the minute you stood out, you would be shot. And both sides of the soldiers were so tired fighting 20, 23 hours of war every day. And it was quite one of the most grueling battles of them all. My own regiment saw 370 soldiers killed in 24 hours. It was a bloodbath. With days as time passed, what we noticed is the bodies that we were decomposing because nobody could risk and come into the trenches to pull the bodies out. And guess what? We had no toilets. And thus led to a lot of people dying due to diarrhea on the right. And that is how it was. But the footing six conducted them with such honor. They gave their life for their for their for the king. And that is something that the brigadier and the general recognized us 
and said and six got some of the greatest recognition in the war for being one of the most trusted soldiers that the allied forces could have and then yeah and this is a picture of the anzac and the new zealand forces sitting together with each other and spending time remember australia was a very racist country and they never fought with other soldiers of other races and this was a battle situations in trenches made friends out of strangers and we shared tea coffee and they used to love the chapatis that i used to make and that ladies and gentlemen is the history that the war actually did to bond people from different races and cultures to be what they would be we were remembered in the countries which fought along with us here you see a cartoon that used that used to appear in australian newspapers this these were not depicting the war they were selling products based on the valor of the sikh soldiers you can see on the right the rest of the folks in the trenches busy passing time sometimes you literally were passing time in trenches for fear of putting your head up and there is the brave sikh soldiers standing up no helmet and that is something that the sikhs were known for and they were firing without fear of or worry and that is something that that the sikhs were known for so all this happened in the war and one fine day i was shot and i was in the trenches blood was oozing from my body i knew that the bullets were everywhere and it was only a matter of time that they would die thoughts raced through my mind and i wondered what am i doing in these trenches in a far off land the enemy that i know not who and for a king who doesn't probably know what i'm going to do and that let me wonder if this was the right decision that i take but then i told myself sometimes sacrifices need to be made to build a nation and i felt good that i had contributed to the war and i hoped that future generations of our countrymen would actually remember my our stories and celebrate them when they look at their freedom with pride i'm still around and my soul is still around and every year i come to these memorials and i come here every year for the honor that i get i realize i'm still not left in peace i come here i think about my name in this little corner out there and that keeps me going to come every year my whole life was a little etching of my name on that monument and the country doesn't care that and that is the truth and the only other thing that i love is going to my native home and watching my great grandson look at the picture of mine against the wall of my vintage picture in my arms and he looks at it with a little twinkle in his eye and that keeps me going ladies and gentlemen a soldier like me has only that left in his life just to go back and and feel about his honor and nothing else because the rest of you here have forgotten our stories you have started enjoying your freedom in a manner that you do not know how you got it and therefore people like me feel bad that though we gave our lives for the country and the building of the nation unfortunately we don't quite have the honor that we wanted to fight for and i ask every one of you in the room to spare a moment when you go see a war memorial when you cross that tomb think about that soldier and the sacrifices he has made think about the story and the family behind it that stood there for him and that ladies and gentlemen would be your little bit to contribute to the sacrifices that people like me sada singh made from the colonel school 14th secret thank you very much thank you